three, two. Hello, welcome to the next session of LeadX, leading the leading by example in the, in the world Southern community. Today we have with us Yuri Schneider from Transcending Stuttering. Yuri, thank you for, for spending your valuable time with us today. There's no better place to be. Thank you for the opportunity. Would you take a moment to describe your organization? Mm. Well, if you asked me that six months ago or 12 months ago or 24 months ago, it would be different. It's kind of like an organic growing organism and organization. And I think that's the first thing about organizations is making room to grow. It's kind of like those pants I got when I was a kid to have the elastic belt that could grow <laughs> with you. So um, essentially it started off as uh, Facebook Live with some phenomenal guests like yourself in some of those initial episodes. And over time turned into a proper podcast so we have a podcast with right now published 78 episodes, Transcending Stuttering, on podcast platforms everywhere. And side by side with that, the biggest thing is to develop a way that's accessible, that is valuable, and both practical for people that are starting their journey of exploring their relationship with stuttering, trying to understand what stuttering is, and trying to figure out in their life how they can get more of what they want and experience more of the things they want to experience. And that includes people from around the world, uh, people who are at the beginning of the journey, middle of the journey, and further on in the journey like yourself. And this conversation is an example of you kind of paying it forward and turning back to see what you can contribute to other leaders that are stepping up and to other people who stutter, who are gonna be going down the path that you've been treading so the idea is to create a space where all those people can get tremendous value. So we developed a community platform. It's a private community, similar to what you think of as a social media like uh, Facebook, but it's not Facebook, it's private. And so we're able to control the culture. Uh, information is secure. People's identities are shared within the community, but not sold anywhere or used for any other purposes. And what it allows for is for absolutely barrier-free access to a pool of people just like you, people who get it, peers and mentors, 24-7 access in an asynchronous way. And then we've also built in a layer of synchronous meetups. So once a month, sometimes twice a month, we have master classes. Also, people like yourself and others, always a mix of people who stutter presenting on real life experiences, expertise in a certain industry. Uh, I think yours was one of the most well-received, the entrepreneurial spirit and what it brings to for a person who stutters. And then we have people like Dr. Jerry Maguire talking about neuroscience and people like Michael Sugarman talking about mindfulness and people like Dan Greenwald talking about farming energy and harvesting energy. So there's these different layers, the online community, the events, the library of these recordings, and we're also building a collection of a toolbox where someone can go in and look for what age, what, what type of theme. So let's say someone is an adult who stutters and they want to flex their self-acceptance, or let's say they're a teen and they want to look for different examples of self-advocacy, of openness, disclosure, you can go into this toolbox and like a Home Depot, choose which aisle you wanna go into and see a collection of what's the best of the internet. What's the best of stuttering on the internet, but it's organized instead of it looking like your attic or your garage, it feels more like Home Depot. And you can kind of go through with your shopping cart and find what's interesting and self-service. Um, so all of this is complemented by the community and driven by human people and human spirit. And that's what really is the fuel for the whole thing. But you've got all these different ways you can touch it and use it to help stay strong and go further as a person who stutters. The big call is we want to make it easier for people to transcend stuttering. 
and we've got this community for people who stutter, and we have a parallel community for speech and language pathologists, and it's it's just in its infancy. Awesome work. Did you have any anxiety or hesitation about being qualified enough to lead? I, I mean, obviously. Um, I had a conversation the other night with Daniel Rossi, and he described an impression that he got when we first met at an NSA conference. And he picked up from me a vibe of tremendous confidence. And that was something he was interested in getting to talk to me and learn more about me. I said, that's pretty interesting because inside of me is a tremendous amount of feeling, who am I? Am I going to be good enough? Am I good enough? Um, worried about what people will say, what people will think. But most of all, it's it's inside of me. It's a voice of doubt. And it's a voice of feeling like, I don't have what it takes to rise to this moment. Um, so I deal with that in every arena of my life. And it's remarkable how it's my relationship with people who stutter that has been one of the most powerful forces for me as a person who does not stutter to flex my courage, to listen to that voice, but not let it run my life to make space for that voice and let it be something that keeps me safe and keeps me from doing something impulsive or rash. But at the same time, it's more of a, a warning light, an indicator, it's a data point, but not a director. So I live with that inside of me every day and people who stutter individuals and as a whole are, are truly inspiring, informative, and role models for me. Who helped you during your leadership journey and how did they help you? Well, I've had the opportunity to have relationships with people who are a few years older than me um, in many different arenas. So within the stuttering community and certainly beyond, certainly that's helpful to get perspective from people that have a little bit more life experience. I think that young people bring a tremendous amount of optimism and idealism, energy, time. Um, and sometimes that's well complemented by turning to the elder statesmen and stateswomen uh, and getting their input of learning from the crucibles of their experience. There's no reason, you know, Kids like to do things on their own. They don't like to listen to their parents. But I like the saying that says, just because they, you know, just because you want to walk down that street doesn't mean you have to step in the same pile of poop that I stepped in. So if I can point out to you places where I've had pitfalls or challenges that I wish I saw coming up. So I find it very helpful to speak to people. I love speaking to people that are coming up with fresh ideas today. And I love speaking to people who've moved the ball forward, you know, far before me. Certainly my father is one of my greatest mentors and influences and advisors, Dr. Phil Schneider. And one of the things he always says when I, when I articulate my doubt, he says to me, um, is there someone better to do this job? So when I walk into the office and I wonder if I'm going to meet the needs of this person who stutters, we have a private practice, Schneider Speech. We have this project, Transcending X, Transcending Stuttering, TranscendingX.com. Uh, he always says to me, ask yourself, is there someone better? So that's my counterbalance to the imposter syndrome. It's like, who am I? I? I can't do this. But the counterbalance is to ask myself, is there someone better suited, better fit? Because if there is, I'd love for them to do it. And I will encourage them. But sometimes it's both those things at the same time. I have all this doubt, but I also recognize in the biblical scene of Moses in Egypt, he sees uh, one of the slave masters whipping one of his brethren. And he turns right and he turns left and he sees there's no one else stepping up to save this person. And he says, there's no other person. I guess I got to step up and be that person. 
So I think having that courage, and especially in today's day and age, you see viral videos of people getting into fist fights outside the Astros game or in New York City subways, and everybody is standing in a circle watching and filming. And it is painful to see how few people step in and try to do something, even if they fail, even if they end up taking a fist to the face. I'd rather be that guy than be the one standing idly by and watching and, you know, being a pundit on the side talking about, oh, this is ridiculous. What did you do about it? So I think when we look at the world around us, to me, that's what activates me is seeing there's a call and we want to answer the call. Excellent. Excellent. What challenges did you face and how did you overcome them? I think overcoming challenges is kind of like overcoming stuttering. Um, I'm not a big fan of the word. I think that um, challenge is an opportunity. Those are the words of Dan Greenwald, and those words resonate. And Dan has been a great mentor, advisor, and friend. Challenges are an opportunity because if you feel there's a challenge, it's an opportunity to grow. You can either walk away from it. It might be a signal that you need to pivot away from what you're triggering or it might be a signal that this is exactly where you need to be and uh, when you realize it might be exactly where you need to be and you choose to lean in it's different you you know you see the opportunity and you see what's waiting for you on the other side so whether the challenge is technology whether the challenge is scarcity of time whether the challenge is figuring out how to pay for different things, different platforms, whether the challenge is, you know, this is special and no one's showing up. Um, each of these challenges is usually coming from a certain, coming back to the anxiety and coming back to the scarcity and kind of imposter syndrome. These are stories. They're not real. So, you know, if I'm going to host, let's say, uh, a meetup online and one person shows up and I am frustrated and I feel like that's a challenge. How do I get more people to show up? That's my challenge. The challenge is a function of my expectation. The frustration is a function of my expectation. And the challenge is how I read the situation. It, it, I could look at the same situation and say, wow, what an opportunity to go deep with this person. What an opportunity that I could concentrate on this person's needs and not have to split my attention to try to hit such a broad range of different interests and personalities. If in fact my goal is that I want numbers, I want a lot of people, that's not my goal. But if that was someone's goal and therefore that is a challenge, then one could pause and reflect and see, well, what brought this person? What attracted you? And then maybe try to get feedback from another group of people. Did you know about this? And what would what led you to choose not to come? Or what was kind of drawing you and what held you back or what prevented you? So you can use challenges as a as a learning opportunity. I like that idea of looking at our mistakes or our challenges as experience, lessons learned. How do you motivate a um, an organization of people who stutter? And how do you motivate a an organization of speech language pathologists? Do they have spillover or are they different? So I, I have an interesting thought about motivation. It's a great question. It's probably the most common thing I hear from parents of kids who stutter. You know, he's just not motivated. He wants to do something about it. He's just not motivated. Or, excuse me, therapists will say, how do I get this kid to be motivated? Excuse me. And I tell people up front, I, I don't think anybody, anybody's lazy. You know, Dr. Ross Green amazing website resource he's the author of out of sync child um i think that's the name of it 
He's also more recently the author of Lost at School, Collaborative Problem Solving. He has a website called Lives in the Balance. Unbelievable resource. So he has a saying, he says, people do well if they can. Nobody wants to fail. Nobody wants to lose. Nobody wants to not do well in school. Nobody doesn't want to do well at the job. What happens is if they can't do well, they start doing all sorts of other things that look like they're not motivated, look like they're disinterested, look like they're trying but failing. As a leader, I think it's about recognizing everybody has intrinsic motivation. What's the tap? And how do you tap it? And believing that inside everyone is this desire to succeed, this desire to thrive. And when a person identifies that, and feels like there's a bridge to do that, like it's possible, they're motivated. If it feels impossibly distant, if it feels like it asks too much of me, it's gonna to cost too much, too much money, too much time, too much energy. If the risk is too great, yeah, I'm ready to try, but I also know what it feels like to feel crushed by letting my hopes up. And for people who stutter, I think that's a big one. I think especially as people get older and parents have gone through different experiences or sometimes the best of what comes out of social media is the idea that, wow, I'm not alone. There's a worldwide community of people. The flip side of that is by going online, you sometimes hear some very loud voices that are talking about experiences you haven't had or that you may have had, but amplify um feelings of futility, like it's just not worth it. Why even try anymore? Feelings of, it, you know, I'm telling you, I've been around the block. I've done it all. None of it helped me. And that's very defeating for other people, not to take away from that person's experience, but it can be very defeating for a person to hear that. And um, so I think for people who stutter, one of the things I have to be mindful of is like, What's the upside? This is something I use for myself. I heard it on a Tim Ferriss podcast. I really like it. I think it was said in the name of Warren Buffett that we think about risk and reward. And sometimes we got to think like this. What's the upside? Everybody looks at the upside. So big promises, uh, whether it's in the world of stuttering and stuttering therapy or people selling this solution or that solution or this approach or that approach, they will tout the success of their approach and everybody will have success stories. Everybody will have some numbers that can be spun to tell a successful story. What's the downside? What's the downside? The downside, most people don't talk about that. What happens if this doesn't go well? So you and I carve this time. What's the worst thing that would happen for me? Let's say the technology fails. I get to spend an hour with Tom. I'm happy. Let's say, let's say I don't get to spend an hour with Tom. I'm ready to take that risk. And that's the last thing. So the point is, what's the upside? Maybe this conversation will help one person do more in their own life or, or volunteer to take a position of partnering with someone in leadership or some role they hadn't thought they were able to do. So if that happens for one person, that's an upside. And that might happen for many people, given the work that you're doing with the World Stuttering Network. But even better than that, you know, who knows what could come of this, right? But the downside, like what would be the worst? And then the last question is, can you live with that? Can you live with the downside? So for people who stutter, some people are ready for the upside, but they don't have the capacity. They don't have the bandwidth to live with the downside. Like I could spend $20,000 on such and such solution. I could scrape that together. If that would give me what I need, I can do that. And what if it doesn't work? What about that money? Can you afford that? What about the experience of being crushed and failing? Can you absorb that and bounce back? Some people can, and some people need to know, I don't know if I have a safety net, financially, emotionally, and otherwise. So I think we need to think about the upside, the downside, and can you live with the downside? When you account for that, motivation, it comes naturally. Because if there's something you care about, there isn't a promising upside. So there are benefits waiting. There's a downside that you can live with that's tolerable. It's not gonna, it's not gonna smother you. 
it's going to sting. It's going to hurt. It's going to be frustrating. It's going to be a letdown. But if I, if everything I'm doing today collapsed, I've done it in a way that I'm not overexposed. And I think that's important, you know, for any leader, financially, relationships, et cetera, you need to lead. You can't lead from behind, but you also got to lead in a way that if all goes sideways and blows up, you know, you're in a position that you can absorb failure. Then you can lead with, with daring and with, uh, lead, you know, leaning in and that's good leadership, but you've also got to make sure you can, you can land on your feet if everything collapses. Um, so coming back to people who stutter, I think their challenge to be motivated is to amplify the belief that no matter where you've been, no matter how hard it's been, no matter how many times you've tried and failed, it's worth to try again because you deserve this and it's possible for you. And I really, I'm not saying the words, I believe it. And so when I meet a person who stutters, I am sharing with them one thing that they might not have that I might have, which isn't because I don't stutter and isn't because of the credentials at the end of my name. It's from watching people like you, Tom, and listening and swimming in the waters of the stuttering community to see all the pain and all the isolation and all the suffering that people are going through, different people, and at the same time to see real life heroes, whether it's getting a job at a restaurant, whether it's pursuing a college degree that you never thought you could, whether it's big stuff like becoming the president of the United States, it's not about the person, but it's about the example that it's possible. And this idea that it's not possible is a story that's holding people back. So we've got to amplify the promise of what's possible. That's motivating. We've got to account for why a person would have resistance. And then we've got to show that there's enough here that it makes sense, perhaps. And for other people, it might not make sense. And if someone chooses to opt out, it might be the right decision for them at that time because they might do that cost-benefit analysis and see the upside's good, but the downside is something that I I wouldn't be able to live with right now. And that's fine. And for people who stutter, that's, that's the piece. And then on the other side is speech therapists, speech language pathologists. You know, I think, your audience, our audience needs to know, like, I think speech language pathologists get a bad rap sometimes. I think that people need to recognize nobody goes to school to become a speech language pathologist for the wrong reasons. There are plenty of schooling choices and career options. Nobody chooses this career to hurt people. Nobody chooses this career to make uh, a killing financially. People choose this career because there's something about people and speech and communication and connection that interests them, that draws them. And it's not here, it's in their hearts. And so that's what the original calling is. And then you go to school and you go to work and you get your head filled with all these textbooks and journal articles and research, which are all incredibly important. And then you go to work and you meet people, and you try to integrate everything you learned in the classroom with everything you're seeing in real life. And then you start getting a caseload, 20 people, 40 people, 50 people, 60 people. We just finished cohort eight with uh, transcending stuttering for SLPs from around the world. A woman was there. She never works with people who stutter. She has a kid on her caseload at a school. And I think her caseload is 60 kids every week. So for her, inside of her, she wants to rekindle the idealism and the spirit and the heart that she once had for this field, for this work. She wants to somehow tune down the bureaucratic rat race of just meeting people, writing a report, meeting people, writing a report. And by the time you're done every day, you come home, you feel like a shmata. You feel like you're a doormat. You feel finished. You're wiped out. Your energy's gone. So for people to think that they could do the work in a more spirited way, in a more person-centered way, is attractive to everyone. But the challenge is, how am I going to do that? 
I don't have enough time as it is to breathe. So for speech language pathologists, again, the motivation would be showing speech language pathologists who are great examples of doing great work, of doing it with spirit and also taking care of themselves and their loved ones and, and their financial needs and showing them that it's possible. And that's why it comes back to making it easier to transcend stuttering and providing all these different layers of tools that are practical to put into play that a speech language pathologist or a person who stutters could walk into a meeting, into a therapy meeting. Oh, so you'd like to work on self-acceptance or you'd like to work on self-adjustment. Here, let's look up uh, what are some things we could browse and look at today here. Oh, you want to look for videos? You want to look for some activities? Okay, videos. And look up some videos and see our friend Sam or see Jonathan Costello. So making it easy is important. Once people see it's easy, the motivation comes. So it's not about motivating people. It's about bringing it out and letting people be human again. Wow. <clears throat> long answer you know oh just uh, i am it's just a sign of the good question my seat. that's okay what qualities or personality traits do you look for when assembling your team you know a chider speech and a transcending x the key is to exceed expectations i think i read that once as a thing that comes out of disney I think that they inculcate every person at every facet of interface with their, I think they call them guests, you know, people that can afford to spend a thousand dollars a day for a family of four enjoying the park yeah. with the mice. Um, not to put down Florida, I right. love Florida, but, uh, <laughs> Glad but you uh, clarified I that. think, I, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. California, Florida, fantastic. Yeah. Um, but there's an idea that comes from Disney, and I, I, I absorb that, that I believe that they motivate every person, whether it's the person who queues you up online, who sells you the ticket at the ticket booth, or even the person who shows you where to park your car, that you should strive to exceed the expectations of the guest. So I look for people that resonate with that, that are looking to be treated better than they've ever been treated. I look to bring out of myself to treat everyone around me better than they've ever been treated. Uh, and I ask for the same in return. And it's less of an ask, it's more of a vibe, it's more of a culture. Because if all of us look around and we're feeling like nobody's given us what we deserve, everyone's out to mess us over. Um, we don't feel safe. We can't thrive. And we also have this scarcity software where we don't want to give an extra inch because they're going to ask for a mile. It's just a whole, unfortunately, I think it's very common, but it's something that I can't tolerate. It's not how I live my life personally. And so I try to bring that and cultivate that in our teams. So at the beginning, it's the first conversation with anyone is, you know, in this place, we aim to exceed expectations. And I start with me exceeding your expectations and asking everyone around to do the same for you, whoever you are. And then in return, it will come naturally, but I also make sure it's explicit that you should be asking yourself every day, are you exceeding the expectations of the people around you? For me, if we do that, we have an open, like everything else flows from there. We have an open mindset. We're oriented towards people and what they need, not what I think they need or what I want to do, but it's what would be good for them. So it gets us out of our head. It puts us into a team and it gets that vibe of really supporting one another and getting out of our own heads and out of that scarcity. Because if we, if we do that and everyone around us does it, it works. If we do it and no one around us is doing it, we get hurt. And that's what happens too often. So to me, that's, that's the core of what I look for and what I try to cultivate. And people want that. And people at the same time have been traumatized, shocked, conditioned, that that's not possible. And I just think it is if we work together. What should a person focus on? I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, how would you describe your leadership style 
what is important to you regarding leadership? Hmm. I think rolling it back to the motivation question, something I didn't say, but I think it's all about leadership. You know, don't tell me, show me. So I think a lot of leaders are are distant, are removed, uh, may or may not have been in the role of the people that they are leading, uh, may or may not have been in the role of the people that they're serving. I think it's very important for the leader to be a person who is leading by example. So for me, for example, when I share a picture of me running, it's not some selfie obsession that's not about me it's showing i'm also stretching my comfort zone what are you doing so we have an internal win chat where it's just dedicated and expected that every week everyone will share one win and a win could be i got out of bed on a day that i felt like i just wanted to roll over for like the week (laughs) It doesn't have to be grandiose, and we're not talking about a toxic positivity. We're talking about winning in doing the things that we really want to do and recognizing that we're always going to have to go up a downhill escalator. But what's waiting for us at the top is next level, next level. If we just stay still, we're going to go right down to the basement. It's just, it's just gravity of life, gravity of energy, gravity of spirit, race to the bottom. But if we have the courage and, again, the promise of seeing other people going running up that downhill escalator, let's do it. You know. And so I think from a leadership point of view, we have to lead by example. I think we have to challenge the status quo. It's everybody and, and organizations and groups it's, it's the nature, it's the social nature to be comfortable and to kind of go back to what's comfortable, what's been done, what's familiar. The genius of Apple, and I always think about this, and I am no Steve Jobs, but I do think when he introduced the iPhone, and most people listening may not remember a time before the iPhone, which is pretty unbelievable, but we didn't have rectangular bricks that looked like this. But now every phone looks like this. But imagine that the hottest thing, I think it was only five years before, or maybe then the Palm Pilot came out. Before that, it was like a little square beeper on your belt. <laughs> and then came the iPod. And the iPod was like this revolutionary MP3 player. And it could hold a ridiculous amount. And then you had your phone and you had your MP3 player, and your phone maybe could do texting. And the concept of introducing a device that there was no market, there was no market for a phone, a smartphone that was a browser, that was a music player, that was also a telephone, could also be a personal planner with your address book, your calendar, did not exist. You had multiple devices at that time. Maybe you had a personal planner, a fancy, a Palm Pilot, which I had, but it wasn't a phone. And then he introduced something that there was no market. It takes a Steve Jobs and a company like Apple and forward thinking to do that. Now, you look at the world today and imagine a world without smartphones. There's something nice about that because it's gotten a lot out of control. But it's also opened up the fact that a person in Kenya a person in Nigeria, a person in Ghana can log into a Zoom call and be connected to a guy in New York, in Iowa, and they can connect around things that relate to them personally, but connect us all globally as a planet, as a people. And that wouldn't be possible because they wouldn't have a smartphone in their rural village, in places in the world that are not as connected. So I think when we're introducing something new, a leader has to recognize that the masses want to stay comfortable and stay with what's familiar. There's always going to be friction and resistance to new ideas. You have to think about what is what is the solution or what's the value you bring, but to recognize you have to lead with understanding of the people, but you also have to lead by taking them out of 
the place that they're stuck and bringing them to a promised land. But you got to travel through a desert to get there. And they're going to follow you and trust you if you show that you deserve it. Excellent. Excellent. How do you keep a positive climate in your organization? So the win chat is one thing so that we don't just complain about what's not working. We have space for that too. Positive climate, every meeting on our team, every meeting in the transcending stuttering meetups and every meeting in private therapy. We use this language of glows and grows. People love to come in and say, hey, how you doing? It could be your weekly huddle. It could be your quarterly review, whatever it is. People are used to like starting off and expecting critique. Or maybe there's like, a, you know, I'll toss you one compliment. Hey, nice shirt. All right, now let's get down to business. You've been doing a little bit under. From... So glows and grows is centered on the person. And the person comes, and so I ask, you know, so how was this week? And it's already understood. We've set it up, or I'll explicitly say, what was a glow this week? What was something that either you want to celebrate or something that was was wonderful, that was pleasant, that was nice, something you tried, maybe you failed, but it's something that you're proud of or something that you enjoyed. It could be an exquisite cup of coffee, a new flavor tea, uh, ben and Jerry's just showed up at your door and the flavor just knocked you off your feet. I'm a chubby hubby guy. I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, it just shows something about who you are and it gets you focused on positivity as opposed to kicking off with negativity. And I don't know how to describe it, but it just feels incredibly different on both sides when you start the conversation with that and then transition quickly within 60 seconds sometimes into, okay, what's a grow? What's something we need to problem solve? What's something that you're stuck with? What's something that I could do more for you or do less for you or get out of your way? So glows and grows are ways of kind of checking in on what's going well yep. and make sure we name it. And then what are some things we can do better? But again, we avoid the judgment by just calling it a glow and a grow. And people have hooked into that and taken that back to their organizations, to their therapy rooms. So that's something that I think is proven to be very, very helpful. Um, glows and grows. So I offer that for anybody that wants to use it. Awesome. Awesome. How do you, did you resolve conflicts within your organization? Super question. So also, just because it's fresh, so I won't say who it was. I spoke to a few people who um, have been in the stuttering community for a very long time, and I asked them, what's your perspective, having been around the block and for some time already, what are some of the great things that bring you back to stuttering communities again and again, whatever those communities are? And what are some things that have led you to, at this point in your life, pull back and disengage from several communities? And this person said to me something that I don't think is surprising. Um, I think many people can relate to it, that this conflict between the camps. So in the stuttering community, there can be a camp of people who say self-acceptance, identity, pride, that's what we need. And anything that smells of working on different ways to speak and make speech a little more effortless is, um, it feels like a conflict. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. But before you know it, you've got us and them. Are you for this or you're against this? And it becomes an ideological battlefront within a community of people who all need each other and all have what to benefit from one another. So this person said to me, that's what led him to pull back. What draws him in are the stories, are people's personal stories, are people's real life stuff. And if they're looking for input, being able to provide that. If they're just looking to be heard, being able to provide that. 
Um, so in our community in transcending and stuttering, I was happy to tell him we have not had conflicts and I hope we won't. And if we do, I hope there'll be an overwhelming, and there is, and actually we did have a conflict, but, but again, because of activating the community, so it wasn't about me resolving a conflict. There are individuals that may bring conflict. There are individuals that may have that mentality that just gets very confrontational. If that's happening without any culture, otherwise it tends to play out the way humans play out with us and them and camps and cliques and you're in or you're out. The antidote, and I think a lot of credit to Trisha Hedinger as well, you know, dealing with bullying is the same thing. If you activate a culture where there are values and you set the tone up front and you activate people, so you activate the people that are seeing this happening, it's not my job to come in and be a policeman. This whole community wants to retain and protect something very special, something very precious. So that has allowed us to prevent anything from spiraling out. I hope that will continue to work, but I think that's the secret, I think, is uh, number one, creating the two things. One is activating the people to protect the shared interest, which is a shared culture, a shared vibe that serves everyone well. Descending into conflict doesn't help anyone, anyone, and it certainly doesn't convince anyone on the other side. It just kind of tags people with a with a tag that they might not even want. Uh, and the second thing that's very helpful is in our community, not letting it go to the level of like theoretical, but making it very real. No one can argue with my real life experience. If I went on a job and for me putting stuttering on my resume and saying, among all my other educational accomplishments, all my other uh, experiences, in my volunteer time, I mentor for young people who stutter. Uh, as a young man, Greg, in touch with this week, a couple of years ago, I suggested he put it on his resume. Yeah. He was having LinkedIn interviews. So he put it on his resume, but I said, you have to really do it. You can't just say it. You got to really be a mentor. That became a conversation piece that got him elevated in the interview process and ultimately got him his dream job. He earned the job. But putting his stuttering on the resume for him was a big opener. He told me now there was another layer where it happened again, and it was part of the process of getting a big promotion. And again, that worked for him. For someone else, that might not work. For someone else, they want to learn especially some people have different stutters than other people. So for mm -hmm. Greg, it was about being open and not feeling like he had to hide and suppress and conceal. For another person, they don't ever suppress or conceal because they can't. They stutter so boldly, so strongly. So for them, they want to know how to go into the interview and get out a few more words in the time that they have so that they can make the impression that they're capable of whatever level of communication they feel they can. So those two people are not going to be in conflict with each other. They're each flexing and they're each telling their story and they're not pontificating for others. That's going to be healthy. As Whereas if we talk about what's better to hide your stutter or to put it on your resume, it's obviously going to descend into the conflict. So I think, um, putting where we put where we anchor the conversation what we talk about and if we position it with this has been my experience this is what i'm dealing with is much more helpful than theoretical questions thrown on the table so i think also for support groups and online groups i think that's a very practical suggestion is uh sparking a conversation with a question like what do you think of mm, might be less helpful than, you know, here's something that someone did. Here's what it did for them. What do you think is the upside? And what do you think might be a downside? Or could you, you see yourself resonating with this? Or do you see this being something that might not be good for you? And talking about it in that positioning, first person, as opposed to third person abstract, I think is actually a piece of avoiding conflict because better than settling conflict is avoiding it altogether. 
Excellent. How do you handle negative remarks or criticism personally and organizationally? Try to do it with grace. Mm -hmm. I think um, just like falling down or stuttering can be done with grace. One can do it gracefully. Alternatively, one can be really wrecked by it. So if I trip or fall, or if I come out of the bathroom with my zipper open or have a stain on my shirt, you know, I can make it even more dramatic and more distracting for me. I can make it more dramatic and distracting for everyone around me. So I think the gracefulness with which I'm able to absorb that is one side of the grace. And I think the other side of the grace is giving the other person grace. And a mantra that I use for myself and with others when I feel that I'm being spoken to unfairly or sharply, or if I have my own voice speaking to myself critically or sharply, I like to say to myself, um, everyone's doing the best they can with what they've got right now. And, and in another moment, I'm they or I probably would do better. And it goes back to what I said earlier, you know, everyone wants to do well. If they're not doing well, there's some reason for it. Now, it doesn't excuse the behavior. doesn't mean you let it keep going. So if someone is critical of me, the first thing I'm thinking about is how am I holding? Am I able to absorb that and respond from a place that's level? Or am I triggered and responding from a place that's now hot? I try not to respond when I'm hot. So if it's email, the best thing I think anyone can do is sleep on it. You can write the email. Don't put the person's name in the to field. Yes. Send it to yourself. Draft the email as whatever you want it to say. And then sleep on it and see if in the next morning it still seems like you want to send that message just like that. And I've never woken up the next day wanting to send that. So that's always worked for me. Definitely creating some buffer space and buffer time. I think as years have gone on, I'm able to do that quicker. So like as the person is ripping into me, potentially, as it's happening, I'm going through a process. I'm triggered. I notice that I'm triggered. I notice that I'm getting hot. And if I can in that moment, I kind of regulate myself and just like let all the extra stuff roll off if I can and respond to their comments and I have a recipe for that uh, which I'm happy to share and I'm also thinking if I can't do that do I have a template response that doesn't require any thinking and isn't laced with any sort of animosity towards this person something like wow that was a lot I need a little time let me get back to you and just create space like that between me and the other person without amplifying it. I've received it. And I'm basically trying to just take the plug out of the socket and say, wow, that was a lot. I need some time to process. Uh, something like that, or that's a really good question. Let me sleep on it. Let me talk to my advisors and get back to you. Or, you know, wow, it sounds like you feel very strongly about that, and I didn't realize. Let me get back to you. You know, let me give you some thought. So the, the recipe, do you want me to share? Oh, yeah, for sure. The recipe, and I think it comes from a book called Crucial Conversations, great, great bestseller, but how to communicate when stakes are high or emotions are high. Um, so I think number one is to just absorb and let the person know that they've been heard. So to find a way to verify and uh, validate, wow. So what you're saying is that you feel like I was inconsiderate of X, Y, or Z. Or what you're saying is, you know, you're not comfortable with the messaging that went out. I'm just thinking of another organization, uh, wow, you were really uncomfortable with the messaging that went out and being associated in this way with messaging like that was totally uncomfortable and felt out of line. 
So now you've let them be heard. Generally, when someone is heard like that, when someone is heard like that, they are going to um, just have a beep come in, sorry. When someone's heard, they're gonna become a little bit less hot. And then if that moment is the moment, then you can offer, uh, I hear that, you know, you, mm, then you can offer what your position is or was. You know, I was thinking uh, that this would be a good thing for us for X, Y, and Z, and maybe there was a well thought out. And then you can come up with the third step, which is like a, a compromise or something that uh, meets the interests of this person and also suits your interests. And generally that's, there's plan A, plan B, and then there's finding plan C. That's um, just showing a person that you're ready to do that, even if that isn't the home run you wished it to be. It shows what we started saying was being flexible and open to growth and not thinking you have all the answers, but it's a collaborative. And if that never happens, you're not really leading, you're following. So to be a leader is to be able to be ready for these, you know, things that happen and not to have this, you know, untouchable, unchallengeable, fiery nature that anything that challenges you, you just burn up around you, create these walls to insulate. Uh, I don't think that's leadership. I don't think that's an organization that, that is healthy. I think that leaders need to be approachable, need to be able to receive this kind of stuff, but it doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean it's easy for me ever. And I often anticipate it when it's not even there. And that's where the glows and grows and open communication is really helpful. But uh, EQ is very important, emotional intelligence. What mistakes have you made along the way? And how would you have done it differently? Well, again, I'm a, I always think about what we talked about earlier, you know, mistakes. I think I did much better than I could have done. Like looking back, I have grace with myself. And I think the mistakes were all good mistakes. I think that uh, I'm surprised I didn't make more mistakes, but I certainly made many. Um, honestly, I think the biggest mistake for me is is letting the voice of self-doubt hold me back as much as it did and as much as it does. I think that generally my mistakes are my being cautious my high standards, those things tend to cost me more. And again, that's not for everybody. Someone else may be more impulsive, uh, more provocative, and their mistakes might be learning how to be a bit more cautious. So I think of that, that's the yin-yang for me. So for me, I think my mistakes come from cautiousness. And I guess the other one that's interesting is um, I had an idealistic fantasy even though I'm starting to lose my hair, so I'm not as young as I used to be, I still have a very childish idealism that I think I got from my father and many of my mentors were people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, even 90s that had this boyish charm in their eyes, this youthful way of seeing the world and, and having joy in the world that was otherwise kind of complex and crummy in other people's eyes. So I have this idealism that all the organizations around the world and all people who stutter and all speech therapists would love to sit together and work together hand in hand yes. and march together for a common cause. Yes. And so I hold that idealism and I don't think of it as a mistake and I never want to lose it, but I think I held back and the number of back channel conversations and efforts I made to see, especially during the height of COVID, like this is an opportunity. The world has stopped. We've hit reset. And first is everyone needs to stay healthy. Everyone needs to be able to be safe and provide for their basic necessities and basic needs. On a larger level, as a society, it was an opportunity to pause the momentum that we had to change the way we work, to change the way we interact, and to maybe pick up the phone and call people 
that we haven't spoken to or avoided or had some tiff with. And at an organizational level, maybe to build bridges and create collaboration that wasn't possible before, but now we were all in the same boat and the boat was sinking uh, through this pandemic that was kind of hitting all of us equally. I still hold that hope and I still think we all need to do more, including myself and I invite everyone, every human being. The greatest power we have as humans is the ability to cooperate. We cooperate in incredible ways. We use tools and we cooperate and we communicate. And that's what gives us our supremacy over every other species on the planet. And it's a gift. And I think as people who stutter and as speech language pathologists, we focus on the communication piece and that inalienable right that we all have a different way of communicating, but we better communicate because it's our right and it's our expression of self and spirit. I think we need to also flex on the cooperative side. And I think it takes strength and it also takes being comfortable being uncomfortable and it takes flexibility and nobody wants to be uncomfortable. And a lot of people don't feel easy getting flexible. I'm a very stiff person. I got to work on my flexibility. But but I think the good that can come out of that, it's very much like what we said before. It's a challenge and it's a problem uh, that we can either lean into or run away from. But the possibility, the opportunity that exists when we collaborate, when we support one another, when we use our platforms to lift each other up, as opposed to just seeing who can scream louder or who can draw more followers, that's where most of the world is at. It's not going to end well. Like, it's not going to end well chasing followers on Instagram. It's not going to end well, you know, chasing who can put out the most volume and the most this and the most that. The human stuff, the real stuff, who can show authenticity? Who can show courage? Who's ready to share the best of what they have and ready to share what they're challenged with, with others who they trust? This doesn't have to happen on an open public space. This can happen around the conference room table or Zoom call behind the scenes. And it can also happen publicly with interesting collaborations where we use our platforms to amplify each other because we are a community that is underrepresented. We are a community that is overwhelmed. We are a community on the rise. But imagine with such small numbers, if this is what's happening now, why split all these resources with commitment to stay alone when our whole message is you're not alone. What if ever so slightly people could find partnerships? It's exponential opportunity for impact and change that will serve all of us. Individuals, people who stutter, speech language pathologists, allies, and the planet will look different. Excellent. Excellent. Do you have any closing thoughts for, for our future leaders of the world stuttering community. I do. I think of Parker Mantel and the viral talk that he gave at Indiana University, the commencement speech in 2014. Yeah. Search it on YouTube if you haven't seen it. He stutters, and he gave the commencement speech, and he says, imagine if FDR didn't dare to run for office. Imagine if Stevie Wonder didn't dare to perform. Imagine if Beethoven didn't dare to compose. Imagine the world and what we'd be missing if these people with different challenges and different abilities didn't dare to do things that no one thought they had the business to do. And look at the world and look how much richer it is. And so I asked each and every person to think, what is your superpower? How are you bringing it out? And it can be in quiet ways. You can lead in a classroom as the kid who raises their hand and says, this, this is my challenge and this is what I'm doing about it. And give that presentation, read that page, that paragraph, or 
this isn't easy for me. I'm going to show you how I present differently and doing it in some alternative way. And that's leadership in that classroom. And if you're a teacher and you cultivate understanding and appreciation of every person in that classroom, of their abilities, their strengths, and that in this class, there's a sum total of everything we need to be safe, to be strong, to be smarter together, then every kid in that classroom is going to follow you and remember you for the rest of their life. So I think leaders need to think about, it's not just big organizations, it's every day. It's on the subway when two people get into a fight. Who's going to be a leader? Who's going to look and see that nobody step up? And who's going to be the people who step up? And you're going to get punched in the face. And you're going to get told you have no business being there. But guess what? You do have business being there. And it's the best business. It's the human business. It's the business of not being apathetic. Ellie Wiesel, we're in the midst right now on the heels of years of division and friction in America and in the world. Nothing to do with politics, but just people not being able to see the humanity in one another. Elie Wiesel says more dangerous than anti-Semitism or racism of any sort is apathy. And if people don't care, if people don't realize that when you sit idly by and just see something unfolding, you also are part of it. Pink Floyd. So we've got to we've got to raise our voices and we've got to step up sometimes publicly, sometimes privately. But the most important thing is don't think that you don't matter and don't think someone else will do it because everyone else is waiting for you. I invite everybody to, to join me. I think the other biggest thing is with Transcending Stuttering, it is a place and a platform that I aim to use to support and lift others up. And I really believe that everyone in the community, people who stutter and also speech language pathologists can come in at any point in their journey, exit at any point in their journey and find value at any point in their journey. But most importantly, transform from feeling dependent to feeling like you have what to give. So having people in the community giving master classes and workshops, having people in the community providing mentorship to other people who are entering med school, wanting to talk to someone who's already been there and walking down that hallway in med school. So I think the journey is really for each individual person to come in at a point where they feel dependent, inadequate, they don't have what they need, and they truly can't unlock it themselves to interface with people who actually show similarity, who have a common pain point, but also have the experience and generosity to be a little further up that hill and be able to build a bridge and lend a hand to someone who's on their climb up. And ultimately, we climb together, we give to each other, we care for each other, and we exceed each other's expectations and we exceed our own. Bravo to you, Tom, for being so generous and being one of those people on the hill and so generously offering yourself, your time, your resources uh, to create opportunities for others to to climb their hills too. So I thank you personally and on behalf of everybody that benefits from what you're doing and World Slattery Network. Thank you so much. Well, I realized a long time ago it, and, and it um, concurs with your mindset that we're better together. You know, so sure. it's just... Uh, the, uh, it's just how it is. So, uh, Yuri, it's, thank it's you. That human cooperative, that human cooperative power. We're better yeah. together. We hunt better. We build better. We feel better. So, Yuri, thank you for for the section of um, Lead X. Your words are just pure gold, and, and I know that they will tremendously benefit our um, our leaders now and in the future. So I, I really want to express my heartfelt appreciation for uh, spending time doing this podcast today. Thank you very much. I want to thank you. Last thing is I've already listened to three of the episodes 
and uh, Jane Frazier, Lee Reeves, Hanan Hurwitz among my superheroes side by side with you. So if you're watching this, check out all the other episodes. There are far greater people than me to listen to. And this is going to be an incredible series. So thank you. And if you're interested, transcendingx.com, there's a free community for everybody. And there's no catch. We are better together. It is free forever. And uh, look forward to supporting anyone that wants to be a part of it. Thank you again, Yuri. I will... Um... And we'll talk to you soon, my friend. Looking forward. Thank you, Tom.